Uh, hello, welcome to Toward a Sociology of Climate Risk, a panel discussion and Q&A hosted by the Department of Sociology uh, at, and the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, uh, both at the London School of Economics. My name is Rebecca Elliott. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at the LSE, and I'll be hosting today's event. So I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that the conversation we'll be having today is one that is urgently needed and indeed will hopefully be the start of many more. So finance as an industry, as a set of practices for accounting and valuing, and as a system that constitutes and links political orders intersects with climate change in profoundly important ways. It shapes understandings of climate change, it determines what gets built and who lives where, and it picks winners and losers. Um, so it's therefore essential, I think, that we critically examine how finance designs, diffuses, and uses climate risk. And that's what we'll do here today with the help of a tremendous lineup of speakers whom I'll introduce in a few moments. Uh, but first, just to give you a sense of the logistics for today's event, the panelists will each share insights from their own research in this area for five-ish minutes, uh, which will be followed by a discussion among them moderated by Dr. Daniel Bayonza, Associate Professor of Management at Bayes Business School. We'll then go to the Q&A with you, the audience. Um, please submit your questions in writing via the Q&A function. Uh, and there are some guidelines posted there uh, in terms of how to do that. I'll select them and read them aloud uh, you can also, and you're encouraged to upvote questions that other people have asked, um, if there are questions that you are also interested in knowing the answers to or hearing some reflection about. Um, and I'll, I'll try to offer some very brief kind of summary remarks before we conclude at 4.30 p.m. London. We are recording the session um, and you can find information about that and about where to um, access the recording in the chat. Um, uh, the Twitter hashtag for those of you who would like to tweet about the event is hashtag LSE climate risk. And I believe that's everything. So now to introduce our illustrious panelists. Um, and this will be the order in which we'll be hearing from them in just a few moments. Uh, Nick Robbins is currently professor in practice for sustainable finance at Grantham at the LSE. He's been a champion of climate becoming recognized as a crucial topic within finance, basically uh, since day one. Uh, he's been actively involved in the key discussions and developments, um, both on the, the policy and the private sector sides uh, for decades. Um, and he's worked with the UK government, with the United Nations and helped to found and, and convene multiple international networks. Dr. Tanya Fiedler is a lecturer in the discipline of accounting at the University of Sydney. Her research is deeply interdisciplinary, her interests concerned with the ways in which engineering, actuarial science, and climate science integrate into work practices, business strategy, and accounting. Prior to her academic career, Tanya worked as a consultant for energetics, a specialist climate, carbon, and energy consultancy. Emily Bugden is a visiting researcher to the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge working on climate risk and sustainable finance. She also supports Cambridge's efforts in responsible investment. She's on the advisory board of the EAUC Carbon Coalition and a member of the Cambridge University Offsetting Working Group. And previously she worked on climate finance at the European Climate Foundation. Uh, Matthias Ta Tagger is a PhD student at the LSE's Department of Geography and Environment and the Grantham Research Institute. His research investigates the emergence of knowledge, tools, and institutions governing the relationship between the financial sector and the planet's climate with a focus on the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures and the Network for Greening the Financial Systems Reference Scenarios. His prior experience includes collaboration with Nick and on work that promotes and facilitates research on climate change and biodiversity loss for central banks and financial supervisors. And our moderator for the discussion, uh, Dr. Daniel Banza, is Associate Professor of Management at Bayes Business School. He's a research associate at the LSE's Systemic Risk Center and collaborates with the UK Banking Standards Board. At his recent book, Taking the Floor, Models, Morals, and Management in a Wall Street Trading Room, 
won the 2020 Terry Award by the Academy of Management and the Best Book Award by the European Group on Organization Studies. So with that, I will turn it over to Nick. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. And as a non-sociologist, it's a real delight to be here. And I'm really looking forward to, to learn a lot from, from all of you. Um, I'm going to focus on the carbon dimension of climate risk in, my, in the next sort of five minutes ago. Um, 10 years ago, an unknown London-based think tank called Carbon Tracker released a report entitled Unburnable Carbon, Are the World's Financial Markets Carrying a Carbon Bubble? The report estimated that 80% of fossil fuel reserves could not be burned to stay within the world's carbon budget, and projected that fossil fuel companies would become so-called stranded assets as efforts to tackle climate change took hold. Carbon Tracker was not the first, of course, to focus on the issue of climate risk, but it was perhaps the first to address it uh, as a systemic uh, issue, as an issue for the financial system as a whole. I was delighted to be a co-founder of Carbon Tracker, and our focus on unburnable carbon and the resulting stranded assets flowed from two fundamental failures. The first was the systemic failure of finance in the global financial crisis uh, just a few years before. If a system that everybody had thought was stable was revealed to be so deeply flawed, how could it manage, if it couldn't manage uh, conventional risks, how could, it, how could the financial system manage this unfamiliar threat of, of climate? Something we thought so perfect that always moved into equilibrium. Clearly there was a need for real systemic change. And the second motivation, I think, for the carbon tracker work was the failure of perception. Uh, in the climate risk discussions up to that point, so up till 2010 or so, uh, the discussions were focused on how these very uncertain climate factors could impact on the relative values of specific financial assets, rather than positioning the financial system within the very certain limits of the planet, in this case, the carbon budget, and that's what we were doing, placing the financial system within the, the carrying capacity and the limited carrying, uh, carrying capacity of, of the planet. This report, Unaburnable Carbon, was initially dismissed uh, by the city back in 2011, uh, and indeed one fund manager famously was quoted by the FT as saying, I think it's a bollock subject, I think it's complete hot air. Ten years on, stranded assets and climate risks are clearly now common currency. We have a shift of capital away from fossil fuels, driven by a combination of financial militarianity and the strategic drive for divestment. We have global climate risk disclosure frameworks, such as the TCFD, with states to make this mandatory in many countries. And we have central banks and supervisors introducing climate risk expectations, developing climate scenarios, and making regulated firms do climate stress tests. So where do we go from here in the next year and the next decade? Um, I'd like to suggest sort of five, five priorities for discussion. The first, I think, is we really need to focus on the dual nature of climate-related financial risk, the risk of climate on finance, as well as the risk of finance on climate, uh, what is known as double materiality. And please do read Matthias Teger's beautiful short explanation of what double materiality means. The second priority is the focus then to is on risk outcomes um, and achieving net zero uh, well before 2050 is not simply a question of aligning finance, but is the best way of minimizing risk to portfolios and importantly people. And that's my third point, um, particularly in climate risk. We need to focus more on people in climate risk. I think at the heart of the reason we're all so concerned with climate is the impact it will have on people, most notably the most vulnerable and the least responsible. And yet most risk frameworks focus on physical factors and financial variables, not people. Take a look at the TCFD guidelines, almost no mentions of workers, communities, citizens. We need principles of climate justice and the just transition to be embedded in the design of climate risk strategies. The fourth point is we need to focus on transition plans and the allocation of capital. We now have $80 trillion of assets who are committed to net zero. This is a fantastic starting point. But we need these financial institutions and fossil fuel firms to make sure that their capital investment plans are consistent with net zero from a risk uh, and survival based point. This means no capex for new fossil fuel projects and of course just transition plans in the phase out. And the final point, fifth point, is we need to ensure that these climate risk efforts are accountable. I strongly welcome and has been championing the role of central banks and supervisors and the role they play to drive the climate agenda forward. And I see them as a major role to bring consistency and integrity uh, to the market. Uh, and it's important to recognize that these regulators in themselves, in turn, are accountable to, to people, back to governments and back to parliaments. 
And one area I think for, for future engagement and research is to think about more the role of the econ economic and finance committees uh, in parliaments across the world and how they can ensure that efforts around climate risk in central banks, regulators and in markets are both transparent and uh, accountable. Um, those are my initial remarks. Rebecca, back to you. Great, thank you very much, Nick. Um, next, we'll hear from uh, Tanya, go ahead. Great, thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Just wanna make sure. Yep. Yes. Great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I'm going to try in the next five minutes to uh, distill in a very short form uh, some research that was published by earlier this year by myself and uh, three climate scientists, as well as two independent consultants in the journal Nature Climate Change. Now, the topic or subject matter of this paper is um, the ways in which climate models can be legitimately used for the purpose of assessing um, business risk, um, particularly uh, with respect to the physical risks of climate change. So why write this paper? Well, uh, we felt there was a need given the uh, claims that we observed in the marketplace with respect to the physical uh, climate related financial disclosures that were being made. Um, and in observing these, uh, particularly with respect to climate extremes and some of the local scale information, uh, we just felt there was really the need for an objective resource to be provided for practitioners, for the preparers of climate related financial disclosures, as well as for uh, auditors and the users of such disclosures. Uh, we also wanted to provide um, something of a warning of the potential misuse of climate model outputs and the unintended consequences, which talks very much to uh, Nick's point on uh, the focus on people in the sense that um, capital could be misallocated from areas where it was most needed. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, another motivation for this paper was really a call to arms in terms of the investment that is needed to support the climate modeling community so that it could provide the information that business needs. Okay. Oops. Yep. Okay, so look, before I go on, I just want to explain climate models a little bit. Now, climate models are very, very different to financial and economic models. And I just want to say, of course, I am myself not a climate scientist. So uh, these slides are thanks to my climate science authors, um, but I can take you through some of the basics. So they use the laws of physics um, and often contain within them one to three million lines of code. Each simulation can take up to six months um, they are not statistical or regression based. Um, and so in this, you can already see that they are very, very different to what we normally understand in uh, financial markets, the types of models that we're comfortable uh, with using. Um, as reported in the IPCC, uh, climate models are robust at continental scales above and above. And this is important because that is where um, Climate models have directed their attention because this is what was needed for policy purposes, um, but this is not what business needs. Now, if you look at the uh, picture on the top right hand side there, you can see each pixel is at 200 by 200 kilometers um, and the um, and Earth is basically divided horizontally and vertically uh, between these pixels. Now, climate models don't simulate rare events well, um, and that is because the observational data just simply isn't there, which obviously has implications for climate extremes, which are by their very nature rare. Um, and climate models also don't simulate weather scales well, which is again important with respect to climate extremes, and in particular with re respect to the types of impacts that businesses would be concerned about. Now, <clears throat> climate models need future emissions in order to estimate future concentrations in order to estimate um, the future climate. And there are layers of uncertainty that build up through that process. The first of these is just simply in the emission scenarios that really depend on demography, technology, economics, and so forth. Um, and the, another one of these, it relates to um, 
the global mean temperature, which if you look at the far right picture there, you can see there's a considerable overlap up until about 2050 in the sense that the range um, around the mean is too great to allow individual emission scenarios to separate. Now, what does this all mean for corporate entities? Well, it means that the type of information that is currently available in climate models um, makes it very difficult um, to provide information that is specific in nature. So if you think of an individual physical asset, it makes it very difficult to provide information that is comparable in kind um, or that is reliable and verifiable um, across different entities and sectors. So where to? Uh, now, in the short term, we describe in the paper that a business can undertake a forensic analysis of its accounts to understand where its exposure might lie. A business can then engage with climate scientists and ask whether probability can be provided with respect to the risks um, uncovered and um, where these can't be provided, whether some form of pathway um, can be um, provided. Going on from that, um, there is a deep collaboration that is needed in the provision of a, what we call a bespoke estimate of risk. So off the shelf uh, products, are, we, we suggest in this paper, highly problematic. Um, the climate science community themselves do not understand how that type of product can exist given they themselves are unable to do it. Um, so, the bespoke analysis we talk about is one which relies on expert judgment um, and it is partly based on physical climate projections, on physical climate predictions, expert judgment, as I said, and um, scenarios. Um, over the medium to longer term, we then describe um, a reverse process to what is currently happening. So at the moment, what happens is that there's this information, climate information that's provided in largely in the public domain that is incredibly complex and that business picks information from simply because that's the information that's available. What we need instead to happen is that business informs climate service providers who then themselves inform uh, the development of an operational capacity, which then informs climate research and, and then it provides a pathway back and forth again. So that's pretty much it. Um, hopefully that was within the five minute limit, Rebecca. Yes, so far dead on for, for okay. um, <laughs> right. uh, Emily. Thanks very much. Hopefully I'll try to um, stick to the time as well. Um, so let me just share my screen. Is that working fine? Okay, great. So thanks very much. Great to be on the call. Um, my name is Emily and I'll be talking today about some of the tools that are being used to measure corporate climate alignment. So since the Paris Agreement was signed, the finance sector has been under increasing pressure from stakeholders as some of the things you've heard already um, to show how they're taking action on climate change. And this has led to a proliferation of tools that have aimed to try to measure how companies and investor portfolios are doing in terms of aligning or driving the, the zero carbon transition. Um, they become critical in shaping the trajectory of the transition. And so it's really important that they're guiding us in the right direction. Obviously these are incredibly complex challenges and the, these tools have required an incredible amount of deep thought and hard work. But um, what, what I'm trying to highlight here is some of the areas where um, we can continue to scale up ambition together. So in particular, um, there's a question around emissions intensity versus absolute emissions. Um, so emissions intensity has emerged as one, as one of the central metrics for measuring corporate climate alignment over the past few years. And it's a great example of where a sociological analysis is really useful in terms of um, bringing that lens to climate risk. Um, so the emissions intensity metric rose to popularity through a project launched in 2014 by a coalition, including CDP, WRI and WWF, who came together to develop the sectoral decarbonization approach. Um, it's a relative measure that shows emissions of a company or entity as a product of total activity. So here in the graph, you can see this is the emissions intensity of various um, countries and that's 
their electricity sectors. So um, tons of carbon over gigawatt hours. Um, the sector-based emissions intensity approach has become uh, foundational to many corporate climate alignment tools, including TPI, SBTI, CA100, plus the Paris, the PACTA tool, Paris Agreement Capital Transition Initiative, um, PCAF, and the TCFD Knowledge Hub. Um, and it's also the emissions intensity approach has also formed the basis of a number of um, corporate climate commitments, including BP, Shell, Total, HSBC, and Barclays. Um, so, what are some of the potential unintended consequences of this? So, most importantly, emissions intensity reductions don't always result in real emissions reductions. In the graph, you can see some analysis done by Oil Change International of Shell's 2017 climate target to reduce its emissions intensity by 50% by 2050. Um, the pale gray section above shows the 50% emissions intensity reduction, and the dark gray shows that if Shell were to continue to grow on its average growth trajectory, its real emissions would still grow, rise by around 10%. Um, unfortunately, the normalizations of the normalizations of emission, emissions intensity as a metric has allowed a lot of oil majors to release greenwash climate targets that mask business as usual fossil fuel expansion plan, plans or unrealistic reliance on greenhouse gas removals. So a couple of examples are that um, the climate strategies for ENI and the International Airlines Group could use up, up to 12% of the world's total available nature-based offsetting capacity. And Shell's latest 1.5 scenario would require planting trees over an area approaching the size of Brazil. Um, a couple of other issues are around um, that intensity targets make it hard to incentivize um, wind down strategies. So um, that would be wind down or managed decline strategies are where a fossil fuel company or a high carbon um, company chooses not to transition, but instead to gradually close its high carbon assets and return capital to shareholders. But because not all companies will be able to transition, it's really important to recognize and reward this type of approach. So the, the sectoral decarbonization methodology itself acknowledges many of these issues. Um, so it says absolute reduction targets are the most meaningful in reducing total global atmospheric emissions. Um, they're more straightforward to measure and communicate. And there's no guarantee that emissions intensity targets will deliver emissions um, reductions in the atmosphere. So why has emissions intensity as a metric become so widespread? Um, usually the most often cited reasons are for companies to make it easier to set achievable targets and for investors to make it easier to compare between companies. Um, the SDA methodology document itself says the absolute nature of um, targets may be a disadvantage to companies, especially if they're, um, yeah, uh, especially difficult to achieve if a company is growing. Um, so this is where it's really useful to bring that sociological lens. So in other words, the ability to insert these tools into the present paradigm of corporate relations without disrupting certain norms such as growth or com comparability has been seen as a more legitimate way to drive change rather than setting targets that might be more effective in driving real emissions reductions. So as you've heard from Tanya, what matters most in terms of climate is the level of absolute emissions that are released into the atmosphere and the higher the concentration, the higher the potential higher for adverse impacts. Um, and uh, as mentioned by Nick, you know, um, there's a high proportion of unburnable carbon up to 80 percent of fossil fuel reserves of known fossil fuel reserves. Um, so we we urgently need to drive absolute emissions reductions as soon as possible. Um, so what do we need? Um, tools and targets that drive down real world emissions as a priority. And though I focused on emissions intensity, there are a number of other issues that crop up in these tools that would benefit from a sociological analysis. Um, but for now, the things that I see are most um, important are targets that take account of a fair share of emissions uh, that cover the full scope of all GHGs, including scope three and all equity share of emissions, um, short, medium and long term targets and targets that benchmark against low risk um, 1.5 compatible scenarios with a low reliance on greenhouse gas removal, such as the IPCC P1 scenario. Uh, 
So thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much, Emily. Um, and last but not least, before we uh, open the discussion, um, uh, Matthias, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Great. Um, thanks so much. Um, I'll present kind of the skeleton core of a paper that Daniel and myself finishing up at the moment, um, which wants to make a first step toward a sociology of climate risk. So essentially what I'm trying to do here now is to come back to Rebecca's introduction, the theme of the overall um, event today, and kind of try to tie together everything we've heard from, from Nick and Tanya and Emily, um, and kind of show how it all might fit together within a sociologically informed um, approach to climate risk. And at the very start of um, any sociologically informed approach to climate risk, we need to stand the acknowledgement that um, climate risk is a social phenomenon. Yeah, it's a social construct. That means that climate risk is different from climate threat. Yeah, for instance, a, a storm surge, a drought, which is physically real and unaffected by our attitudes or thoughts about it. Whereas climate risk is imagined, essentially, yeah, imagined by financial analysts, modelers, central bankers, etc. And um, what it implies is for climate risk to become real and affected uh, and effective, um, it needs to be legitimized in particular social context. And we just heard from Nick how long and laborious it was to establish um, climate risk as a fact within the city. Um, and Daniel and myself think that we are at, we're by now at a point where the, the existence of climate risk is not so much in need anymore for legitimization. That's kind of construct that's done, but where the real action happens in terms of constructing climate risk is um, the modeling, the calculative practice of figuring out how, how much climate risk is there and where is it. So. Um, we focus, uh, we make kind of the focal point of our approach, the modeling and the calculation of climate risk. And our framework for that is fairly simple. Um, we spell out three phases of, um, of modeling, constructing climate risk. The phase of designing a climate risk model, diffusing it, um, and then implementing it. And um, I'll kind of now tease out key implications from financial sociology um, we can draw on um, in these three phases. So the first phase, the design, uh, for the design phase of any climate model or metric, a key lesson from financial sociology is that um, any model is infused with the values and assumptions of the social context that is designed in. Yeah, a great example um, that became obvious during the financial crisis is how um, the assumptions and tenets of the accounting profession um, shaped enterprise risk management and um, made it blind um, towards uh, regarding uh, the systemic risks, um, the interconnected, uh, the risks from interconnections between entities. And for us, for the climate risk debate, that raises the question to what degree um, um, assumptions and values within financial accounting practice might be problematic for climate risk um, disclosure and assessment. Um, and Nick raised uh, the point of uh, the necessity for a double materiality approach, which is not part of the core gospel of the accounting profession. So it's not a surprise that the IFRS Foundation now rejects uh, the double materiality approach for its sustainability accounting standards um, to be made, which is highly problematic. And we also heard from, um, from Tanya about how core principles of financial um, uh, financial accounting are, simply cannot be fulfilled for physical climate risk, um, which uh, um, um, which leads which should lead to the question to deeper questioning of the suitability of financial accounting principles for um, for climate risk. Moving on to the second phase, um, I'm a little bit rushing through here, but um, moving on to the second phase, the diffusion phase. One key finding from financial sociology is that core financial models, such as the black scholes mutant model for option pricing or um, uh, the Gaussian copula formula for, CDO, um, for CDOs, they did not diffuse because they were so accurate, but they were useful. They were useful in organizational contexts um, to communicate, to book PLs, etc. Um, and we just heard from Emily that we can see 
similar dynamics when it comes to carbon intensity metrics, which are highly problematic on many levels, both for transition risk assessment, for alignment assessment, etc. Um, but they're useful to build financial products, to screen portfolios, to compare. Um, so the question that is being raised here is really we need to interrogate um, widely diffused market practice regarding whether it's useful for an organizational status quo or useful for an originally intended goal. Moving to the last phase, the implementation phase, um, uh, one key lesson to be learned from financial sociology is that organizational silos can lead to an improper implementation of risk models which uh, we kind of painfully experienced during the financial crisis where um, the siloing within credit rating agencies led to a systemic mispricing and um, misrisking of um, uh, ABS CDOs. And Tanya's paper very well speaks to that point and um, uh, warns that we must not make a similar mistake with physical climate risk models um, and shouldn't allow uh, these risk models to just be parachuted in as black boxes into financial institutions. So the question we want to raise here is really um, where maybe might um, organizational silos um, lead to an improper use of models and how and when do we need to integrate these silos and bridge these gaps. So to wrap up, um, yes, we think that in our first step toward the sociology of climate risk, focusing on the calculative practice of climate risk is, um, uh, is an appropriate first grounding, but we also acknowledge that that's not enough. A truly sociological approach needs to go um, further and interrogate um, bigger things, so to say. Um, so we advocate very much assuming our perspective and approach. What does that mean in practice? For instance, I've only been talking about very traditional financial risk um, uh, um, conceptualization of climate, kind of climate risk as exogenous risk. Zooming out would mean thinking, for instance, about endogenous risk, thinking about radical uncertainty or completely alternative cognitive framing, such as climate alignment. Um, so I hope what also comes out of this is that with this paper, we want to open up a very broad debate about what a sociology of climate risk could look like. And I'm really looking forward to having this discussion with you right here and right now. Wonderful, thanks so much. Um, certainly lots of grist for the mill here. Um, I'll turn it over now to uh, Dr. Daniel Banza, who will moderate more of a discussion between our panelists. Okay, um, well, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. And let me just reiterate how exciting it is uh, to uh, be here at this uh, panel event. Um, I have a couple of questions and depending on time, we may uh, go into additional questions. Uh, but my first uh, question is um, initially uh, targeted uh, to uh, Tanya and to, and to Nick, um, although uh, the other panelists feel free uh, to uh, uh, give your input as well. Um, so, um, and this is a question about financial models um, and specifically financial models and their role in the uh, upcoming um, uh, COP26 um, in Glasgow this coming November. Um, so uh, Nick, uh, you spoke about carbon tracker and the fact that surprisingly enough, the financial system seemed not to be doing anything about climate risk 10 years ago. Um, and Tanya, you spoke about this uh, gap in scales that climate models present uh, for engaging in meaningful financial valuation work. So it's as if the entire city of London, for instance, is just encapsulated in a single pixel uh, in those uh, climate risks. So given all this, um, my question for both um, panelists is, to what extent do you expect climate risk models to be a substantial force to mediate the outcome uh, of the upcoming debates at the uh, at the COP26, at the Climate Summit. Um, will uh, those models be just a sideshow uh, in essentially political conversations and sort of like, you know, horse trading going on in the background? Or uh, on the contrary, is there a sense uh, for you that climate uh, risk models will play a meaningful role in that understanding uh, these, these models uh, might give us an insight into what comes out of the uh, COP26. Thank you. Either of you, please. 
uh, well, yeah, I mean, I suppose I mean, COP26 is a big intergovernmental game, uh, not game, sorry, it's a very serious um, summit. And it's going to be primarily around core commitments by governments, particularly to net zero and resilience, and core commitments on climate finance, largely public finance from developed countries to developing countries. But I think in the surrounding package that's going to be developed, which is around making sure the financial system globally is allocating capital to net zero and resilience, particularly in the places that need it most, which is the developing countries and emerging markets, it will form a very important point. And, and clearly, uh, the, the, the is sort of models in, in a more classic climate models, which are, are informing that, the recent IPCC report, uh, other models from the IAA, um, I think are going to be informing that. Um, but I think in terms of the implementation phase, this will be key. We have one of the sort of major sort of private sector initiatives leading into COP, this uh, Global Financial Alliance for Net Zero, uh, which I cited $80, $80 trillion of assets committed to net zero. Um, we have the, um, the, the, the uh, Green Financial System, uh, the Network for Green Financial System, central banks, they're also actively involved. So I think uh, it, it's going to be, the models are going to be important, perhaps not at COP, but it could be super important for actually how COP is interpreted. And I think particularly, as Emily highlighted, um, all the, the variety of different measures whereby financial institutions, private financial institutions, but also financial authorities are struggling to provide a sort of quantitative frame, which is adequate to the challenge, uh, recognizing that these these mon these models are, are by no well can never be perfect re representation. So I think they're crucial on the implementation uh, phase. Um, I would I would say, but uh, Tanya, I'd be really interested in what you're going to say. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, look, I I I'm inclined to agree with you that it's less around uh, what's happening at COP directly, um, but more around the implementation in terms of um, if, if we think about key COP outcomes, um, such as adaptation uh, to protect communities, obviously there we're, we're talking about climate risk, physical climate risk. If we're talking about um, net zero, we're talking about transition risk, et cetera. So, so clearly, uh, climate risk models will be will feature in implementing um, these various goals. Um, my big concern, however, goes very much to um, Matthias's comments around um, observations from the sociology of finance um, around the siloing, um, and and that's clearly what we're seeing happening so much. Especially, it's perhaps less relevant for uh, transition risk um, because it's understandable that where transition risk is concerned, uh, we would be focusing on economic models, and clearly we, you know, we reference IEA and so on. But from a physical risk perspective, uh, there is a deep need to integrate to become familiar and comfortable with climate science and climate models. And this is something that the um, finance sector and that economists have not done to date, um, and they have not necessarily done it all that well. We know that there are existing problems with integrated assessment models. Um, and it seems to me that there is a tendency, a growing tendency, um, to instead go to economists um, to solve these problems rather than going to the climate science community. Uh, my understanding is that there are many climate modelers who, when they understand how the um, outputs of their models are being used within finance, are appalled. Um, they had no idea that they were being used in this way. Uh, so I feel that there is a really deep need for a, a transdisciplinary approach, which I, seems to be just being completely sidelined um, from what is currently happening. So that is my fear um, in, in what's, um, I suppose, in the lead up to COP as well as, um, you know, moving on from that just in terms of what we're seeing with TCFD and, and NGFS in particular. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, to Nick uh, and to Tanya. Uh, does anyone else in the panel uh, have a pressing point to make on this issue of the uh, COP26? Um, otherwise, I would move on to uh, um, the second question I prepared. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So let me let me then uh, uh, introduce uh, a question uh, for Emily uh, Bogdan and, and from Matthias. Um, and so this question is about, uh, in a sense, the limitations of the very frame uh, of this event, which is uh, focused on uh, climate risk. Uh, but um, how can scholars and, and policy experts develop a better grasp of, of the nature and especially the limits of this, of this uh, uh, climate risk uh, assessment in, in, in risk perspective. What role, in other words, does finance ultimately have or can have in the wider context of, of the present climate emergency? Um, and, and what are the risks, sorry, what are the limits uh, uh, to a, a, a frame on this problem that is entirely based on risk? Uh, in other words, uh, if not a climate risk, then what alternatives uh, exist out there that allow us to think about how climate and, and finance come together? Um, so um, long question, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, Emily, uh, Matthias, either of you, uh, uh, feel free to start. Thanks, thanks, I'm happy to go first, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot in there. I think um, um, I'll start by saying one limit to the risk frame that um, my colleague, Dr. Ellen Quigley at Cambridge has been working on for some time is um, the, the way in which current models and approaches favor or focus almost exclusively on risks from climate change to investor portfolios or to companies um, without um, kind of accounting for the risks that portfolios create within the real economy, which often aren't analogous. Um, so for example, an investment in a gas pipeline in the global north may not face immediate transitional physical risk from climate change, but is creating risks in the real economy by locking in new fossil fuel infrastructure at a time when we need to be reducing it. Um, I think more broadly, the perennial issue that you're kind of dealing with when you bring a risk framing is that um, there are, uh, though there are many areas where the, um, these agendas align, ultimately there won't be a business case for every aspect of this transition, but we still need to find a way to, to take fast action on it anyway. Um, a, a couple of, more, of other points more generally, I think um, when, we, when we kind of make decisions exclusively based on climate models, we're... Um, we're missing the ability to um, meaningfully integrate qualitative data a lot of the time. So the impacts of climate change are already happening all over the world. And many of the worst affected are historically and presently targeted communities, particularly people in, in countries that have been subject to colonization. Um, so for me, one of the most important things we need to do and to keep doing is to ensure that we listen to and respect those voices and make them central to any decisions that we are able to kind of glean from the climate modeling we do. Um, and so, yes, much of this will be qualitative, but we still need to find a way to incorporate it in an effective way. Yeah, I try to not be repetitive. Um, Emily made, yeah, a whole lot of really, really great points I can only agree with. Um, on the kind of on the question what can what can policymakers and and um, and researchers do to get a better grasp of climate risk well it can be cheeky and say take a sociological approach right be um be interdisciplinary i think tanya really um have at home that point but also going beyond climate scientists it completely escapes me how um iem teams can um ha can cope without any political scientists in there but they make quite um but they model political systems and all that um so that's just um yeah that's another aspect where interdisciplinarity is needed and as emily said also diversity yeah um physical um physical climate risk is very 
much focused on the European and North American context and flooding works differently in Europe than it does in, in Africa. Um, asset distribution is, um, is approximated by um, uh, nightlight data, for instance, that works great in industrialized countries, doesn't work great when most of the assets are agricultural assets, right? Um, just as an example. Um, and to, to, the role, to the role of finance and then the limits of, um, of, of, of the risk frame, um, the role of finance can be um, can be anything, right? If it's if it's really well regulated, something that now even um, you know market lovers like Mark Carney call for, then it can be such great force to to protect what we can still protect. Um, otherwise, if we leave it as it is, uh, it will absolutely remain one of the main drivers of climate change for multiple reasons. One is we still haven't solved the tragedy of the horizon, which is kind of baked in the current financial system. Um, and that was the whole kind of um, watershed moment in 2015, right? The Carney speech on um, the tragedy of the horizon, still not solved. Um, then finance doesn't care about justice and fairness. And we've heard from multiple panelists now how important that is. Those hardest hit are usually the poorest ones and therefore the um, most silent voice within finance. Um, so why should finance um, uh, care and mitigate if um, the first, say, 90% of loss is just um, negligible from an asset value perspective? And then um, uh, more towards the, the, the kind of mathematic risk frame, that very mathematized culture that we have in finance um, that developed, that has developed in finance since around 1980s, um, chasing precision uh, kind of leads us in the context of radical uncertainty that we have in the context of climate change to 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 something like not not seeing uh, not seeing the wood for the trees. Um, there is a lot of certainty around um, what needs to be done to manage climate risk um, properly, which is mitigating climate change right that's the best that's the best climate risk uh, management strategy we know that we don't need more models telling us that we know, don't need to make um the iems more precise we don't need to integrate more um transition uh, transmission channels and all that we know that um so my fear is that this risk frame is in addition to everything that emily said is also um sidetracking us um, Okay, um, thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Emily uh, and Matthias. Um, so um, I had uh, prepared uh, an additional question that I could potentially uh, put to the panel, but uh, uh, depending on on our uh, host's view, I can either uh, keep it for later. Uh, I see that there are, there already is a number of questions on the chat. Uh, what do you say, Rebecca? Um, I think, yeah, perhaps let's involve the audience at this point. Um, and some of their some of their questions might anticipate your question, and and if not, um, we can return to it towards the end of our time together. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Over to you then. Okay, great. Um, just a reminder, you you can post your questions in the Q and A, and also upvote other questions, which just helps to give us a sense of what the kind of you know predominant concerns and and, um, um, and ideas are, you know, in, in the room. Um, so please do take advantage of that feature. Um, I actually, I want to start with what is currently the kind of most upvoted question. This is from Robert Charnock. Um, and he asks, is this move towards a sociology of climate risk focused on the financial sector? It strikes me that the handling of climate risk can be quite different in other sectors with calculation currently playing a more muted role than the, the role that a lot of um, you have been talking about today. So how would a sociology of climate risk differ if it focused on sectors other than finance? Um, could I have a go first go at that, Rebecca? Go ahead. Um, I, so, so I'm just reading your question again, Robert. Uh, so is the move towards the sociology of climate risk um, focused on the finance sector? I personally, so Matthias, I, I hope you don't mind me answering. <laughs> this, this, is, this is my interpretation, obviously. Um, 
I would say no. Um, it's not focused on the finance sector. It's that the finance sector is being used as a model from which to address this, um, the sociology of climate risk. Uh, but we have to remember as well uh, that this discussion is largely driven by TCFD, which is driven by um, the financial sector, by, and in particular by, by the investors. So, but TCFD is for companies and corporates and organizations of many different sectors um, to respond to. So um, the issues that we can learn from the sociology of finance around design, diffusion, and so forth, they, they apply just as much to um, the ways in which um, corporates in other sectors are responding to TCFD. Now, with respect to um, your point that calculation is perhaps more muted, I don't know that that's necessarily the case because many of the disclosures that we're looking at, and again, I refer to physical risk, um, are relying on quantitative analyses that are being done by third parties, which are black boxed. Um, so, and, and we have lots of talk around the various scenarios that will be used by, uh, that are um, have been developed by NGFS, for example, and how these will be implied uh, applied in other jurisdictions and for sectors outside of the financial system. So I, I would disagree with that point. Um, that's sorry, that's my view. Maybe if I could jump in. I mean, I think what is what is interesting is 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 that the financial sector is perhaps one of the few sectors that actually risk is interpreted in the ways of risk to itself. Um, so I think when you look at other sort of climate policies for other sectors, sort of housing sector, energy sector, and so on, and the policies that are put in place to make these sectors sort of uh, do what they need to do for climate change, um, it, it, the risk approach is not necessarily, maybe I'm talking more on the carbon side, it's not necessarily the approach that's taken. It's actually what, what is needed to uh, deliver particularly national and global, uh, global goals. It's the finance sector where, where Actually, now we're getting to this. I think this is why the moment now is a very interesting pivot point, because we have this dual focus now, both on what are the risks of climate, physical and transition on financial assets and the financial system uh, there, but also what does the financial system need to do itself to ensure that there is a transition to a resilient economy and also to a net zero economy. And we're in that pivot point between these the, these these two stories. So I think the, the risk story, story maybe has been dominant so far. I think it's going to be much more much more mixed. And and so we've seen in the recent TCFD consultation that it's now talking to talk about transition plans. And I think that's where that's where the next uh, real focus is, which is about specific outcomes, which is about hitting net zero with all the caveats that Emily laid before us. And that then does allow, if we're thinking about trying to reach a certain target, which is quantified, models will be needed, assessments will be needed, but there it allows a much broader sense of factors to be included. Uh, because if you start thinking about reaching a certain goal, you can think about how that is going to be uh, reached, who is, gonna, who is going to be affected by that. So I think uh, maybe that goes back to the earlier point about COP, we're at this, this moment where it's not just saying we should be concerned about this sort of distant potential risk and so on. No, this is about the profound reallocation of the $400 trillion of capital in the world's financial system to drive net zero, to become resilient and to deliver sustainable development. Anyone else like to weigh in? Yeah. Um, if, if go ahead, Matthias. Sorry, just for quick, I um, um, I would say, given that we live for, or have been living for quite a long time in an era of financialization, the financial sector, looking at the financial sector also means, and I'm probably just paraphrasing what, what, what Tanya said, looking at the financial sector means looking at the whole economy through a particular prism, right? Because the financial sector pulls nearly all sectors in the real economy in a certain direction. And um, I think what's, what's kind of then interesting looking at other industries would be, in addition to everything that everyone has said, um, looking at a decoupling, which also kind of links to um, what Nick said, that in a real economy, we sometimes have a greater progression already towards alignment versus risk. So it would be interesting to see how internal um, versus disclosure assessments start to decouple or start to 
you know, develop frictions. Um, so yeah, from a more uh, research oriented perspective. Daniel, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so I am going to quickly jump out of my role as moderator and just make a quick point on this uh, question raised by, by Robert. Um, and the way in which, to me, I would uh, think of this question is um, uh, in what way are models making the conversation uh, on climate too narrow? or How are they mediating the conversation? And here, honestly, I am led to uh, Rebecca's own uh, work um, on uh, a flood map risk. And so uh, what, what she shows is that uh, maps are another tool uh, that societies can resort to in addressing those risks. And to me, um, that, that tool raises an important question because it is one thing to look at a map. Um, most of us can understand the map, uh, but when it comes to a financial or economic or, or uh, uh, physical uh, model, uh, then that's a different story altogether. So there's a, there's a risk that um, a, a narrow focus on models might keep the conversation to a very narrow slice of society. And then, you know, what are the concerns associated with that? So to me, that is a, an important question that comes out of uh, Robert's question. Um, all right, thanks very much to all of you. Um, I wanna move now to a question from Chris Tucker. Um, Chris has asked two questions. I'm going to ask just one of those questions, uh, which I think follows on nicely from the conversation we were just having, because I think it speaks to the, what's come out of this conversation, which is that different actors are positioned very differently within the financial industry, within the, the real economy, um, and different organizations have different kinds of aims and, and aptitudes and um, objectives. So this question is about organizations, um, and it's do I, you know, I suppose, you know, principally to Matthias and, and Daniel, but um, potentially others might have something to say, which is, do organizational silos still interfere with implementation of mitigation efforts if mitigation efforts are built into the DNA of the organization? Um, I don't know, Daniel, whether you have a um, <laughs> a good answer to that. I, I'm I'm struggling a little bit because, in a way, it's 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 um, if it's built into the DNA, that suggests that everything is um, really infused with a deep understanding of um, of the matter in question. Right? In that case, well, per definition, you've done away with the organizational silos um so but maybe i'm misunderstanding the question um danielle do you want to chip sure. in Thank sure you. Uh, so uh, the uh, one thing that is uh, remarkable about, about organizations is that at the very heart of organizations there is division of labor so if you go back in time the early debates about the merits and demerits of organized work, uh, go back to Adam Smith uh, and um, you know, the famous pin factory and the uh, concerns raised by Karl Marx uh, about the ways in which um, the division of labor can be negative, drives alienation, et cetera. So um, it, it's very difficult to remove the downsides of a division of labor. Um, one could uh, uh, note the same problem when it came to the uh, financial crisis of 2008. Um, part of the problem, as the research by Donald McKenzie shows, is that the credit rating agencies were misestimating uh, the, uh, uh, the risk uh, that uh, when uh, some assets in a CDO default, uh, other assets uh, do too, so the correlation risk. Um, for them to properly uh, do that, they should have had to put into contact the derivatives division with the mortgage division of those same uh, organizations. So um, estimating that default risk was at the very core of what those credit rating agencies were doing, and yet they got it wrong. Um, so I would say that um, 
the risk is very much out there. And to me, what's interesting is that there's an important work to do for organizational scholars, management scholars, people in business schools, uh, to uh, look at ways in which this problem might be addressed and remedy. My own work, for instance, I looked into the ways in which in, inside a trading floor, informal social interaction across desks helps mitigate uh, those silos. Uh, the work of uh, um, other anthropologists um, uh, speak to similar issues. And so, but I think that it's a really important question and that there's a lot to do, uh, there's a lot to look into that. Thanks very much. Um, this is currently the most upvoted question, and it's a question specifically for Jul uh, for uh, Emily from Julius Cobb. But it, it, I think it does speak to a kind of broader question about accountability, which has come out of um, Nick's opening remarks and then also um, Tanya's work. Um, so the question is, how would you approach sociologically the issues of scope three emissions? especially the conceptual problem or question of accountability of financed emissions in portfolios or insured emissions. When talking to SBTI or 2DII people, this rather conceptual slash political issue is the even bigger question than the also problematic practical issue of grafting and weighting up in downstream scope three. Yeah, it's a great question and, and one that I wish I had had time to explore in the presentation. Um, I think when I've been looking into these kind of methodologies for setting targets, what struck me is that there's a lot of forces working to limit the scope of targets. So um, particularly around um, um, companies defining their own corporate boundaries in ways that will reduce the emissions that they have to report on, for example, um, BP's recent climate targets excludes its large state, uh, stake in Rosneft, which is um, a huge proportion of its emissions. And, um, and there are kind of numerous examples of that all around. So to me, I, I mean, or, or, you know, banks, for example, not, not setting climate targets for their off-balance sheet activities. And there are, there are many examples of this. Um, so I think including scope three in corporate climate targets is really important to counter that limiting force um, to try to expand the scope of these targets to try to make sure that they're really count accountable to the emissions that they are really responsible for, um, especially because it does represent the majority of emissions for high carbon sectors, for most companies in high carbon sectors, such as the financial sector or oil and gas and utilities. Um, so one thing that I've come up against in this um, question is the, the risk of double counting, which is often cited as a reason not to set scope three emissions. But it's I think that's when a sociological lens is really useful because it's kind of prioritizing a risk of not double counting above the importance of setting targets that will meaningfully reduce emissions. So for me, that's kind of got to be always the priority and where we're starting from. Thanks very much, Emily. Yeah, I mean, I think your answer and, and this question really speaks to what sociologists have started to think about as the kind of reactivity of rankings or or measures, the way that, um, you know, the measures themselves uh, then kind of induce or produce certain actions that are targeting the measure, you know, and, and looking good on the measure, as opposed to, you know, achieving the kind of substantive outcomes that the measures are actually supposed to to produce. And so, um, you know, speaking to, to what you were just describing, but also then I think, um, Nick, if you have anything you want to add about accountability and, and its relationship to these kinds of measures, um, at, you know, in the work that you've done in the city and elsewhere. Yeah, no, it's really interesting and thinking about what uh, Emily, Emily's saying. I mean, I, I had the same same issues with, with BP when I was a fund manager. And I think the simplest thing is is making sure that wherever a financial institution or a corporate is getting money from it, they are also accountable for their environmental and social impact. So it's complete. If you're if you're engaged in business in it, if you're profiting it from it, you you need to uh, take account of the um, of the the emissions and also the impacts on on people. Um, and, and and again, I think perhaps we have sort of maybe. Uh, sort of, I suppose, metaphors in other parts of our life. Again, I think the comparisons with the real economy is really helpful. So I think certainly here in, U in Europe, we've got become very used over the last 20 years with producer responsibility. 
and uh, companies, whether they're putting packaging on the market or white goods, nice solid things, that they have a responsibility to take that stuff back. Well, why don't fossil fuel companies have the responsibility to taking their emissions back when it's sold? I mean, it's exactly the same part in the chain, and yet they're somehow that, that they're not responsible for that. They they are responsible for putting the product on the market. It serves a very useful pro, pro, pro purpose, but they're also responsible for ensuring that those um, the the waste of that product is taken back and dealt with and neutralized at source. So. So I think, we, we again, comparing financial sector with uh, real economy sectors actually, I think, maybe allows us to be uh, more practical and, and in some senses more, more, more ambitious uh, in, in, in these cases. Uh, thanks very much, Nick. Did anyone else want to chime in here before we move on? Um, all right, I want to turn now to a question from Jeremy Bryce at the Oxford Martin School, um, because I think this question also speaks to actually the, the second question that Daniel posed, um, but, but reframes it in a, in a really interesting way. Um, and so Jeremy says, I'm conscious that the conversation thus far has focused primarily on modeling and, oops, I've just lost it, where to go? Um, sorry, on modeling and accounting for the physical impacts of climate change and for the financial costs uh, risks might create. I'm wondering where other categories of climate risks such as reputational and regulatory risks associated with energy or other transitions might feature within an expanded sociology of climate risk and what sorts of analytical tools might re be required to grapple with them. And I think some of the examples, in fact, that Emily was just giving about um, you know, how, how corporate entities try to kind of measure in, in, in order to communicate, you know, a certain profile um, speaks to, to Jeremy's question as well. Um, yeah, happy to have a go at it. I, um, in my mind, these kind of transition risks, yeah, whether policy risk or um, reputational risk, technology risk, etc., that fits quite squarely into um, what we've been talking about already um, this very similar problems arise um, when it comes to policy risk the main tool within finance at least are integrated assessment models that are currently being used and um, one could definitely have a whole series of events just going through the three phases of design diffusion and implementation teasing out how in what ways IAMs are quite deeply problematic, um, starting from assumptions around um, economic growth in the global south, right? If you look at um, the SSPs um, um, that are typically being used by all IAMs, um, there might be like one or two years where there's um, negative growth in uh, a global south country, and that's it. Anyone, uh, anyone who's just vaguely familiar with um, how economies in the global south uh, work know that that's just um, far removed from any reality, just as an example. So point being, IEMs very much um, as transition risk um, models fit into, um, fit into our framework, indicators typically used for, um, for reputational risks such as you know, ESG scores of, of the typical sustainability rating agencies, sustainalytics, um, um, what is it called? I think the controversy score or something like that. MSCI has a score as well. Um, I think the lessons from financial sociology that we just kind of touched upon and have been mentioned um, provide a really good basis to interrogate these kinds of models and metrics as well. Anyone else like to speak to Jeremy's question? All right. Oh, Emily, go ahead. Sorry, it's not a complete answer, but just one thing that I keep coming back to is the importance of integrating um, questions around the some of the social um, and equity in impacts of climate change. And that's a major risk that kind of is systemic and um, as well as you know, being an important concern for, uh, important moral concern. Um, so, and again, I don't know how that can be integrated or modeled um, in a way that 
truly acknowledges all the things that need to be acknowledged but I think yeah I think we just have to be become better at um at integrating the the qualitative data like as I come back to the my answer for the first question Go ahead. Yeah. could I build on what Emily was saying I mean one of the things that and, and, and again it'd be really interesting to hear the other panelists one of the things is in a sense it's a great success that the financial system is starting to think about climate climate change and climate risk and so on but I think we're already seeing that, and maybe as, as you were saying, Matthias, in, the, in your framework, that as it starts to think about climate risk, it's thinking about it in, in certain terms and certain frames. Uh, and then it maybe is, is stopping at a point and not thinking about consequences. There's already quite good, uh, very robust research suggesting that as credit rating agencies and other agencies start actually uh, taking account of the vulnerability and uh, of particularly uh, least developed countries to climate shocks, obviously they start crystallize that into their assessment of, of, of risk and costs of capital go up in those countries, exactly in places where actually least responsibility, but also most need for capital to actually invest in resilience and, and the transition. So, so I think that's, that's, that's an example, I think, of showing that, yes, climate change is, 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 is a risk to financial assets, and we know finance is also, its current in many activities, is also a risk to, to climate and people. But, but also we need to sort of think through this consequentially. So one of the things I'm hearing a lot and again, this is really for all the people on the call, is that it, it's one issue is the models, but the more profound issue is the capability and questioning of the people who use those models and know what the results might mean. Because I think that's the real gap at the moment, is that people might actually see these models not as, as potential inadequate tools which are helpful in decision-making, but as the answer, which would be really problematic. Um, and particularly actually as the answer, and then not thinking through what's coming of the impacts could be, and as, as Emily was pointing out, particularly about uh, of those who are most vulnerable uh, to, to this really serious issue. So, so I think that's one of the challenges is, 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 is both the models, but also how people interpret them, and particularly financial system people who are never going to be climate experts. Yeah. So how do non-experts, non-sociologists actually actually think about these flawed, but potentially useful models in their, in their work. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Daniel, did you want to get in here? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think that Nick uh, is, is raising a really important point. Um, the uh, part of the research that I have uh, done over the past years is on the uh, development of the uh, uh, environmental, social, and, and governance um, uh, sector in, in finance. And, um, so uh, one of my uh, biggest surprises was to see that um, an organization, uh, a financial uh, information uh, provider, uh, put a huge amount of resources in developing the most rigorous, the most detailed uh, system that would provide raw information for investors. Um, and to the surprise uh, to the people running that company, uh, there was very limited take up. And the reason was that investors didn't have the uh, knowledge uh, for how to use uh, that raw data. They much preferred to have uh, an ESG rating uh, for their companies, which uh, in a way that they don't have to uh, think as hard. But at the same time, um, what that tells you is that uh, they were using very blunt tools. And so, you know, if you take all these in ESG, now you think about uh, climate risk, there's a real danger uh, that the data may not be used properly, even if it is very well designed. Thanks very much to all of you. Um, so this question is for Matthias, but I'd actually like to frame it more broadly, if I may. This is from Felicia Liu. Um, and Felicia asks, can you comment on how the zoom out framework could translate to better policymaking? But actually, I think it would be really interesting to hear all of you reflect on how, you know, what, what you think the kind of key, the key policy, new policy, policy change um, ought to be, um, which is, you know, a hard question and question that maybe academic sociologists are very often very reticent to answer. Um, but, uh, but something that I think a lot of people are keen to, to hear from our panelists. Um, 
I'll have a first go at it, but I'm also really interested in hearing everyone else's thoughts. Um, uh, first of all, thanks, thanks Felicia for that question. Um, to make it short, I think zooming out, um, making the zooming out approach useful for policy, I personally think about it and in terms of which frame is um, the most appropriate. And certainly it is not the asset focused risk frame that um, has been at the center of thinking within finance over the past years. Um, I was um, uh, positively shocked when um, the Banque de France and the BIS published a book slash paper um, called uh, titled The Green Swan. And um, they really expanded and zoomed out, I would say. They looked at systemic risk and not just systemic risk in the sense of that traditional, well, not traditional, that kind of systemic financial risk that we learn to appreciate after the financial crisis again, but systemic risk in the sense of the financial system is dependent on climate integrity. Um, so, and as Nick said at the beginning, embedding the financial system in that wider context of, uh, of, of a planet, yeah, of a planet that we all depend on. Um, if we make that the coordinates, the coordinate system for, um, for policy making targeted at the financial sector, I think that would be a massive step forward. Um, Thanks very much, Matthias. Uh, Tanya, go ahead. Yeah, uh, look, I, I suppose I just really want to second uh, Matthias's comments. Um, it's one of the, I suppose, the things that most fascinates me as an accounting researcher, um, that we have these assumptions of, you know, the entity with a boundary around it. Um, and, and what climate is really exposing is, is, is that these assumptions are just no longer valid. <laughs> we just cannot, we, we, we really have to expand beyond those boundaries and beyond this entity concept. And, um, and, this, is, and this whole of systems thinking is uh, where we now need to move towards and interconnected systems. It's not just, as Matthias was saying, it's not just the financial system, it's, it's the interconnectedness of the financial system with our natural systems. Um, and, and it's very, very clear. I, it presents enormous challenges for standard setters. How on earth are we going to reconcile this? I, it's, it's, I mean, you know, intellectually, it's a wonderfully interesting problem. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's for, for society. Uh, and we have to try and resolve these things quite rapidly. Um, so uh, yeah, how that's going to play out, I don't know, but um, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so uh, my reading uh, of um, Matthias's uh, point is uh, my reading of the, um, uh, how do you handle this? How do you do this zooming out? Well, first of all, what is what the zooming in in the first place exactly? And um, my reading of it is that what's really going on with the uh, use of climate risk uh, as the uh, leading frame is a process of what Michel Calon uh, originally termed economization, which is to turning, uh, turning a phenomenon that is diverse and complex and hybrid into an economic phenomenon. And now that, that is productive because it translates a complex problem into uh, dollars and cents. Um, and then that then is easier to bring into the attention of those who are in finance and in charge of economic uh, decisions. Um, but uh, what I found in my prior work on financial models is that when you engage in these sorts of translation, uh, you end up reconstituting the phenomenon that you are trying to address. It changes in the case of uh, uh, banks uh, as they uh, began to put the problem of uh, risk into dollars and cents. They went from small investment banking partnerships into large mega banks with a far greater risks for um, ethically compromised decisions. In the case of uh, climate, 
my concern is that uh, what we're doing now is we are uh, putting central bankers in the driver's seat uh, in, in, to address uh, the biggest problem that the world is currently facing. And, um, you know, uh, uh, when I think about that, uh, still, uh, I find that uh, mind boggling. So I think that uh, there's a greater conversation to be had uh, about whether these technical and, and political and moral issues, how they are all bundled up and, and how is it going to be handled? Emily, please. Yeah, just, I, it's not quite in the same vein, but in terms of, and if I've not, capture the question quite right then sorry but in terms of what we might want to be thinking about in terms of building these things into policy making I, I I just yeah like to reiterate the point about building in the framing of the risks that portfolios and companies are creating to the economy rather than solely the many of the models that we currently have which look at the risks to the portfolio from the real economy, which are quite different. And I think that might, I think that is zooming out in a way because it's sort of trying to look at the bigger picture, um, the systemic risk picture. And I think it might, um, if we can mandate that in policy, either sort of hard or soft policy, then I think that would be really useful. Uh, Nick. Thanks. I mean, particularly uh, thinking about sort of Daniel, Daniel's point, I, mean, I think, what has been interesting, really interesting about the the, um, the role of sort of central banks, and I've been sort of watching this, I suppose, since about sort of 2013, 2014, and, and talking to the then um, central bank governor of the Bank of England, and, and they saw no problem. They actually saw they saw no problem because they believed that um, if if it was a problem, the market would price it, and assets would re um, re uh, sort of find a new equilibrium, and everything would be fine. Um, that that moment has has passed. I think you'll find very few central bank leaders who see themselves as being at the heart of solving the problem. They're, 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 I think they're trying to actually re understand what is their role in, in dealing uh, with this. And I, I'd like to say a couple of examples which I think are quite positive in this, this, this agenda. They're not sort of solving it, but actually show that ultimately it is governments, uh, democratic accountable governments, which are going to need to drive this transformation of the financial system. The first actually is from the UK, uh, where the Chancellor, the Finance Minister in March this year, updated the, uh, the mandates for the major financial regulators. So the UK has, the central bank is operationally uh, independent, but the Finance Minister accountable to Parliament has the right every year to send remit letters, which say, dear governor, as you are implementing your process of thinking about prudential risk and monetary risk and all the rest of it, please think about the following. And now they have to think about net zero resilience and the del delivery of an environment to the same government. So I think actually that's a very helpful sign of a person who is democratically accountable to the people of the UK, actually signaling to the Bank of England as a public institution, the things that they should be taking account of. The other is in France, um, where which has been a real leader, particularly in, in climate disclosure. And there, the requirement on both financial institutions and on real economy corporations is to report about financial risks. So the risks we've been talking about, what would happen to your assets and portfolios in various scenarios, but also about your alignment to the climate agreement, the Paris Agreement, and also to global biodiversity. So I think that is a quite a helpful recognition that actually we need to be walking up with both legs, as it were. We need to be recognizing there is a financial risk dimension, but there is this broader alignment. And I think that the French reporting model is particularly helpful and, and hopefully other countries will be adopting it. Thanks very much, Nick. And I wonder now, um... Nick's, some of Nick's comments speak to Daniel, I believe the last question that you were going to pose. Um, and so I thought maybe you, you might want to pose that now since I think it, it speaks to some of these concerns. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, it is exactly uh, on this point. Um, and so this is a question for all panelists. Um, and, and so the question is about the challenges that arise when societies uh, delegate uh, or partly delegate uh, to the next point, um, responsibility for the climate emergency uh, to risk uh, modelers um, who at the end of the day uh, will in many case, cases be unelected officials uh, 
executives in banks and financial institutions, uh, or perhaps working for international uh, organizations. Um, so how should these uh, specialists be governed um, and how to ensure that non-elite uh, voices uh, are included uh, in the debate? So anybody um, in the panel, please. Um, I, I have a not very sophisticated answer, but um, on, the, on the broad strategic level, which is still the level where we need to make decisions at the moment, the answer to how to organize decision making in my eyes always needs to be democracy. Um, and uh, the um, there are in there's there's a there's a huge literature and practitioner experience on um, uh, the practice of democratic innovations and how to interlink expert judgments with democratic decision making processes uh, through citizen panels through town halls. Um, um, but more concrete local uh, formats like even participatory budgeting and all that kind of stuff. And I don't see a reason why we shouldn't have a citizen panel on the role of central banks, why we shouldn't have a citizen panel on financial market regulation um, uh, as it pertains to climate change issues, um, citizen assembly or whatever format is the most practical one. Um, that's my... Uh, not very sophisticated, but kind of deeply felt answer. I think that's a fantastic idea. I mean, and one of the things, I mean, one of the things which, again, often when we're talking about results solving climate change, we talk in technological terms, sort of solar, electric vehicles, or uh, various, various things. And actually the greatest innovations are going to need to be social. And I'm really glad, Matthias, you brought up that point. There's been really interesting innovations, both at the, I suppose, the policy level, the citizens seven in the UK, France, many other places, um, but also in, in the corporate world, one of the things that the, um, the, the, the need to achieve rapid action on climate change is actually starting to think about who, who makes decisions. How are corporates uh, governed? To what extent they involve uh, their workers, communities in just transition plans? To what extent they actually develop, sort of uh, negotiate uh, just transition plans at a local level and, and, and elsewhere? So, so I think that's, that is a really interesting area. Um, and therefore does, when we're thinking about financial institutions and, and financial regulators, how they are, are, are accountable to people. I smiled a little bit, uh, Daniel, when you talked about um, how should specialists be governed? And I thought, um, that, that should also apply to obviously academics and other people <laughs> who are contributing to these uh, to these debates. And obviously, sort of relatively few people are, are are elected. I mean, obviously, boards of companies are elected and, and so on. But there is a very sort of I suppose sophisticated way of thinking about uh, accountability. But all all of us who are involved in this need to be accountable. But I like this idea of the sort of the social innovation that we need to pursue here. I just uh, want to play a little bit of de devil's advocate here, um, and and that is to highlight that actually the the rate at which the pace of change since um, the formation of TCFD um, has been phenomenal, and. You know, whilst you know we might criticise some aspects of it, um, it has shown that um, the the role of central banks and and supervisors, um, well, it has shown that they can be so much more agile and and provide uh, or motivate uh, responses in in the market in ways that governments have not yet really been able to do. Um, so are they elected? No, but have they done something quite radical? Yes. And, um, it's, yeah, it has, it has its faults. Um, but the, so the idea of, um, yes, <laughs> now, um, democratizing that process is, 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 is very appealing. The, the other thing that I just wanted to add on, and that was in response to one of your comments, Daniel, um, was uh, in, in relation to Cologne and uh, processes of economization. Cologne also talks about civilizing markets and, um, and the, the 
tripartite integration of or uh, well, the scientization and politicization of, of markets and um you know there's a real and he talks about the potential for climate change to show a different way in which to build markets um and i think probably from what emily um it, continues to remind us um, there's probably another, there's a fourth aspect that we need to bring into that. Uh, but it's very interesting, this process, um, what it reveals to us about how future markets might be designed, um, at, you know, from what we're learning uh, through climate. Emily, you want to get the last word here? Yeah, not too much to add, just really interesting ideas around kind of corporate, um, revising corporate accountability which would be yeah great if we could start doing some of those i think there's um a lot to learn from the movements for transformative and um restorative justice in terms of how to manage accountability in really democratic and non um conflictual ways um but in particular i think a lot of a lot more of these decisions could be more much more radically decentralized to the communities that they're actually affecting and i think that will help us make better quality decisions yeah, so I'll finish on that. Thanks very much. Um, we are a minute over time um, and we could have gone on longer, which I think is a, a sign of a really generative and, and rich conversation and a conversation that needs to keep going um, in, in any number of different kinds of venues going forward. So thank you to all of you for uh, the panelists for your contributions today. Thank you to the audience for your attention and interest, and especially to those who asked such great questions. Um, it really provided a, a very stimulating conversation, and there's a lot to take away. Thanks, Rebecca. Well Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. It was Thanks. a great conversation. Thank you.